Hey there, Mr. Olson here. This is my first video of the year. That rhymed. Anyway, um, this is for August 30th, 2016. Um, I decided not to make videos for the previous days on that because we had mostly review, but this is our first new stuff for 8th grade math. So, let's get right to it. Um, for all my videos, you ought to take notes on everything we do and uh, write down those notes, and then show me the notes, and then you'll get credit for the days that you missed. Sound good? I think it sounds good. Um, I might occasionally give you problems that I'll tell you to work out on your own, but uh, for the most part, we'll go over it, and you can see kind of what we're doing, and yeah. So, problem number one. A plus 3 equals 7. What? Oh, solve these equations. Check your answers by substitutions. So let's go over this. Uh, pause the video. Try these out. That's always what I'll tell you in every video, repeatedly. Pause the video, try it out on your own, then press play. Okay, a plus 3 equals 7. So we'll subtract 3 from each side. a equals 4. Yay. Remember, you're always doing opposite operations. If we have a plus 3, we might have to do a minus 3 to get rid of that. So a equals 4. Now we're going to substitute to check our answer. Put the 4 in for a. 4 plus 3 equals 7. And then 4 plus 3, that is 7. 7 equals 7. Yay. Whenever you're checking a solution, you should always make it obvious that your solution is correct. If we only get to this step right here, that's not as obvious as this one where it's the exact same thing on both sides. Uh, I have students with more complicated equations where you might have something like 3 times 4 plus 2 is equal to uh, 5 times 4 plus 1 minus 2 or whatever. And they put a check mark by that because obviously these two things are equal to each other, right? It's not really obvious, is it? Um, in fact, they're not even equal. You not just put in the number and say, yep, it's good. You put in the number and solve it to where you can show that they are, in fact, the same. Let's say we made a mistake on this problem. We just, our brain wasn't working as well as we'd like it to. We ended up getting that A equals 5. If we substitute that, we'd have 5 plus 3 equals 7. 5 plus 3 equals 8. Those are not the same. So that means something is wrong here. That's why we check our answers, is because it gives us a chance to know if we're right or not. If we aren't, then we might catch that. If we are, then we know that we are. There's not too many subjects where you can know exactly whether or not you're uh, right. You don't have to like kind of wonder and think, well, I think I wrote a good book report that analyzes the book the way the teacher wants. I think I did a proper science experiment. No, you know you have the right answer in math, which is really cool. I like it. Problem number two, b minus 4 equals 9. We want to add 4 to each side. We're subtracting, so we add to get rid of it. Write your problems in this vertical order like this. It is a great way to keep your work organized. Um, it's also great for me to see that you have your work done the right way. Most teachers will expect you to do it that way. Let's check our answer by substituting. Should have gone through substitution. 13 minus 4 equals 9. There's a variety of ways to check your answers. You can go back and redo the problem. You could kind of do it from a backwards way. For instance, I had students that say, well, I just checked that b minus 9 equals 4, or 13 minus 9 equals 4, and 13 minus 4 equals 9, so that's got to be it, right? Um, this substitution is really the, most, the best way to check your answers. It is the way that a teacher, a professor, wherever you're going to have people with math, this is uh, that are judging how you checked your answer, that you proved your solution. This is the way that they do that, all right? Plus, it has an added bonus that it teaches you to substitute, uh, teaches you substitution. Substitution is an important skill in math. It's something that you really need to know how to do. So, um, practicing it by checking your solutions makes it so you're better at it. I all the time have kids that are very smart that don't feel like they need to check their answers as often, so they don't. And when they get substitution, they're not as good at it as students that aren't, maybe aren't as smart, or maybe it's that they're smart, but they're also smart enough to know to check their solutions. And so because they always check with substitution, they're very good at that when we get to that point. Okay, problem number three. C divided by four equals six. So we divided by four, we need to multiply by four to get rid of that. So C equals 24. Check our solution, plug in 24 for C. 24 divided by four equals six. Hey, that is a 6. Yay, 6 equals 6. Fantastic. Problem number 4, 5D equals 10. We're multiplying 5 by D, so we divide by 5. D equals 2. Plug that back in, 5 times 2 equals 10. 5 times 2, hey, that is 10. Fantastic. 
One other one that I'll see people do every once in a while is that they will, let's say we accidentally got d equals 3, so when we write in substitution, 5 times 3 equals 10, and because we've written that, we want it to be true, so we say 10 equals 10. Check, I'm good. No, actually think about it. Don't just jump to an answer. Okay. Class business. Today's objective, we're going to talk about putting numbers in the right order and understanding what the different types of numbers are. We'll get into uh, some of those today. Not all of them, but most of them. Class business. Box tops. Anybody have box tops to turn in? No one does because I'm talking to you. You do video. I suddenly, I actually turned the class right there to be like, anybody? Anybody? There's no one here. Box tops. Leaving. Always let me know if you're leaving. Always bring in box tops if you can. Good things. What's good right now? Um, you know, this is my first video of the year, and I am excited about it. I think we're going to have an awesome year, and I look forward to it. So, yeah, hope you guys are too. Okay, if you get out your book and turn to page... I still haven't remembered to put the page number on this. Oh my gosh, every single class I didn't have the page number on this problem, and it bugged me so much. This is in section 5.1, and it is page... Page 284. 284. Now this, I want you to use a calculator. If you don't have a good calculator you can use at home, uh, feel free to come in here and I will teach you how to use the calculator we're going to be using for this. Uh, but I, I like a TI30X2, I think is what it's called. Uh, works out really nicely, does what you need it to do. Now, I just point out, yes, this guy, he's wearing a jacket like I do and a button shirt like I quite often do, slacks, and even those shoes are kind of similar to one of my pairs of shoes. Um, Glasses too. This guy is actually based off of me. Uh, a friend of mine was part of the committee that wrote this textbook, and uh, they liked my jacket. So said, "Hey, can we change that teacher character and put a jacket on him as well?" And they're like, "Yeah, that looks great." I'm just sure that didn't happen. Someday though, there'll be a math textbook that has a cartoon version of me in it. Someday. Someday. So uh, it says your science class is conducting experiments to see how the weight of a paper airplane affects the distance that it can fly. Your class is divided into two groups. Group 1 uses a yardstick to measure the distances that an airplane flies, and Group 2 uses a meter stick. Right there. Is there an issue with the science experience? Just think about that for a second, all right? Hopefully you came up with the idea you shouldn't measure it with two different types of units. Group 2 then takes the measurements in meters and converts them to feet. That's messy. It's sloppy. It's no good. The results of the experiment are shown in the table. So, we've got this table here. 20-pound paper. 20-pound paper? <laughs> That's ridiculous. What paper weighs 20 pounds? Oh wait, the uh, cartoon version of me has something to say. Because paper is typically sold in 500 sheet quantities, paper's weight is determined by the weight of 500 sheets of paper. So 500 sheets of 20 pound paper weighs 20 pounds. Thank you, me. So that means that really, they're not each, each piece of paper does not weigh 20 pounds, a whole bundle of it weighs 20 pounds. Okay, it says your science class needs to compare the group one measurement to the group two converted measurement for each type of paper, and it wants you to write those as decimals. Um, yeah. So, there's a couple different approaches to this. With the calculator, let's say we have that 7 eighths. With the calculator, we can actually convert that to a decimal by uh, just typing in 7 divided by 8. Type that in on a calculator if you have one handy. Hopefully you got 0 0.875. 0 0.875 is the correct thing on that. And then we can just add in the 13, 13.875. Another way to do this, uh, on the calculator that I like, there's a button that says A, B over C. People call it the ABC button. I call it the fraction button because it's referring to a fraction. You can also do a mixed number, which is A and B, C. So if you hit uh, 13 and then this button, and then uh, 7, and then that button again, and then 8, the calculator reads that as 13 and 7 eighths and a fraction. Then we need to hit the fraction to decimal button, which is above the probability button. You have to press second to get the step above another button. Hit the fraction to decimal button, and that will change this into 13.875. It's especially handy going the other way around because there aren't these sorts of tricks as easily for the other way. B, you write 14 and 3 eighths as a decimal. So uh, do that on your own. Number two, it says to graph the group one measurements for decimals and the group two conversion measurements. So that 30 point, try that on your own first, pause the video. 
Okay, so 13.875, that's between 13.8 and 13.9. Which is it closer to? Hopefully you said 13.9. Or thought it if you're not big into talking to a YouTube video. Um, let's label that. That point that is group 1. And that's their 20 pound paper, so G1, 20. Group 2 had 13.9, so that would be right here. G2, 20. Find the uh, decimals for this one and uh, graph both of those. And yeah, I'll expect to see that when you show me your notes. All right? So in your notes, you're going to show me your warm up. You'll show me this stuff on this page. And you'll show me the crazy stuff we're about to talk about now. So think about like simple numbers. I want you to make a list of a couple of simple numbers, all right? Write down a couple of them. OK. What you hopefully listed are what I call the, what I call, I call them natural numbers because that's what they're called. That's actually their name, natural numbers. And if you have the correct type of sort of simple numbers, you have numbers that will be in this list. One, two, three, four, five, da, da, da. You might have it. Six, eight, 10, 9, 13, 27, 100, 127, 200, 227, 1,000, 1,000, 227. There's all sorts of different numbers that are natural numbers. In fact, they go on up to infinity. Kind of cool. Natural numbers, think of it as like numbers that you see in nature. You're walking, on, you're walking down a trail and you see five trees to the left of the trail. And you see three deer running through the trees. You find 5,823 leaves on one of the trees. Those are all natural numbers. If you can get to it by counting, then it is a natural number. Next up, I don't know if you guys, can you guys hear the uh, rain and thunder? Because I can, it's sort of cool. Can't wait to run out to my car in this weather, it's going to be great. Whole numbers are the next group. Whole numbers add just one number to the natural numbers. Natural numbers are included in the whole numbers, as well as one extra number. Think, what one number would you add on if we could add just one number to this? Think about it for a second. Hopefully you came up with zero. Zero is kind of missing. Natural numbers are just positive. That is all. There's no other types of numbers than natural numbers, just the positives. Whole numbers are the positives and zero. What else do you think we should add? What other types of numbers should we add in? Hopefully you said negative numbers. Yeah, for sure. Negative one, negative two, zero, one, two. This set has all the negatives and all the positives. Going up to positive infinity here and negative infinity there. These are called the integers. In one of my favorite movies, a character is being interviewed um, by a doctor and, well, a doctor, by an English professor who's kind of acting as a doctor for some reason. It's very complicated. But he asks him, what's your favorite word? And the guy says, integer. OK, there are people on the hall. Wow. Thought there might be. Integers. That gives us our negatives and positives. Gives us more options. With natural numbers and whole numbers, you can only add or multiply and guarantee that your answer is still natural or whole. For instance, 1 plus 2 equals 3, also a natural number. 3 plus 4 is 7, also a natural number. Whole numbers similarly. 2 times 3 is 6, natural. 2 times 4 is 12, natural. But if you subtracted, 5 minus 3 is 2. What if we add 3 minus 5? Would that be a natural number? No. But it would be an integer. So integers allow us to subtract. What about division? We could have 6 divided by 3, that would equal 2. But what if we had 3 divided by 6? That's equal to like 1 half. So we can do some division, but not all division. To be able to divide anything we want, we need rational numbers. Rational numbers include any fraction, any division problem, as long as it's not divided by 0. You can't do that. Not allowed. I sometimes say it is a natural fraction. That means a fraction over natural number. All these ones. That means no zeros. A natural fraction of an integer. And that means you take any integer, put it over a natural number, and that gives a rational number. Now, some of those will be natural numbers, like that uh, 6 divided by 3 that I said earlier. That equals 2, which is a natural number. Other ones won't. 1 over 2, that's a fraction. All of these groups cannot have fractions or decimals when you have it completely simplified. So this is natural because it simplifies to a 2, whereas this is not. Because it doesn't simplify to anything else. It is just a that. Now if we were to change that to a decimal, what is the decimal for 1 half? 
We can have decimals as well in rational numbers. If it's written as a decimal, it should be a decimal that ends like this, that doesn't go on forever. Decimals that end. So natural fractions of integer, of an integer, of integers, I'm gonna change the wording on that, sorry. By the way, you should have all of this written down. I should be able to see this in your notes. I should even see where you erased because I changed it from natural fraction of an integer to natural fractions of integers. Decimals that end. And we also have some decimals that repeat forever and ever and ever. One over three is equal to point three repeating. Decimals that repeat. Let's look at that, decimals that end or repeat. So one half, one divided by two. Long division. Long division is important, you should remember it. You'll use it uh, in a couple years when you do polynomial division. And if you've forgotten how to do regular long division, it's going to be a lot more difficult to do polynomial. So, how many times does 2 go into 1? 0. Add a 0 here, 10. How many times does 2 go into 10? 5 times. 5 times 2 is 10. Subtract, we get 0. That means there's no remainder, and we are done. So 1 over 2 equals 0.5. On the other hand, what if we have something like 1 over 3? 3 goes into 1, 0 times. Add a 0, 10. 3 goes into 10, 3 times. 3 times 3 is 9. Subtract that. We get a 1, bring down a 0. 3 goes into 10, 3 times. 3 times 3 is 9. Subtract that. We get a 1, bring down another 0. 3 goes into 10, 3 times. 3 times 3 is 9. Subtract that. We get a 1. Hey, it's doing the same thing over and over again. This is what we call a repeating fraction, or repeating decimal. As soon as you get to where you have the uh, same remainder as you started with, or as you've had earlier in the problem, then you are repeating. So really we could just do, let me erase what we don't need. We could just get to this point right here and we would know that that repeats. Since it goes back to what we started with, the whole thing repeats. If it only goes back to something we had a few steps in, not the whole thing repeats. Let's look at an example of that. Uh, one divided by six. Six goes into one, how many times? Zero. Six goes into 10, how many times? Once, one times six is six. Subtract that, four. We got a zero. Six goes into 40, how many times? Six, six times six, 36. We got, gives us a four. Ah, we have a four like we had earlier, so it's not repeating the whole thing. If you're ever unsure, just get one more digit. Six goes into 40, how many times? Six. Oh look, the six is repeating, but not the one. So we put a bar just over the six, and not over the one. Okay, try finding the uh, decimal for the following fractions. Let's go with 3 eighths. Uh, and remember, you put the top number on the inside there, bottom number on the outside. 3 eighths, 1 twelfth, and 4 ninths. So how many times does 8 fit into 3? Oh, try this on your own, pause the video. And we're back. 8 goes into 3 0 times. Add a 0, it goes into 30 3 times. 3 times 8 24. Subtract that, we get a 6. 8 goes into 60 how many times? 7. 7 times 8 is 56. Subtract that, we get a 4. 8 goes into 40 how many times? 5. 5 times 8 is 40. Subtract that, we have a 0, and we are done. 3 eighths. 0.375. 1 twelfth, that one, do on your own. 4 ninths, let's look at that. 4 divided by 9. 9 goes into 4 0 times. 9 goes into 40. 4 times. 4 times 9, 36. Subtract that, we get a 4. Oh, it's repeating. 0.4 repeating. That's kind of convenient. 4 ninths, 0.4 repeating. I like it. Let's now look at changing it back. This is going to be kind of complicated, but follow along as best as you can. All right? So, let's say we had, I don't know, 0.5 repeating, why not? And we're going to say that the 0.5 repeating, that is x. We know that some number is equal to 0.5 repeating, all right? We don't know what that number is, but it's a fraction. Well, we want it to be a fraction. So, we're going to do a bit of magic here. We're going to multiply each side of the equation by 10, giving us 10x equals, if I've got a bunch of 5s repeating, and I multiply it by 10, what will that do? Think about how multiplying by 10 affects the decimal place. Hopefully come up with the move to the right by 1, which gives us 5.5 repeating. Now we're going to subtract these two equations. 10x minus x equals 9x. By the way, you can always subtract two equations. 
Don't believe me? Watch. 5 equals 5 minus 3 equals 3 gives us 2 equals 2. Look at that. If we have the same thing on each side of the equation, which you always do if it is an equation, then when you subtract two equations from each other, you get another true equation. Yay! So 9x equals, let's look at this, 5.5 repeating minus 0.5 repeating, what would that be? 5. Then we can just divide by 9 on each side, and x equals 5 ninths. Booyah! This was kind of weird, right? Kind of bizarre, right? Hopefully you're saying yes. If you got that completely on your first try, then you are a very smart person, because I did not get this my first try when I was in math. Uh, I saw my teacher do this, and I was like, what the heck? There are tricks, though. Notice 0.5 repeating is equal to 5 ninths. 4 ninths is equal to 0.4 repeating. As it turns out, any number repeating, 0.2 repeating, is 2 ninths. Any single digit repeating, you can just put that over ninths. So what would 0.7, well, I'm sorry, what would 9 sevenths be equal to as a decimal? Hopefully you said 0.7 repeating. What would 0.8 repeating be equal to as a fraction? Hopefully you said 8 ninths. What about, oh, what if we had 0.9 repeating? What would that be equal to? And hopefully you come up with 9 ninths. What is 9 ninths though? Think of that as a division problem. 9 divided by 9, what does that equal? It equals 1. Whoa. So if 0.9 repeating equals 9 ninths, and 9 ninths equals 1, that means that 0.9 repeating equals 1. Back in the day, this was like a classic internet argument. People would always argue about this online. I don't know why, but they did. Today, where you have, say, maybe arguments about politics, or Kanye West, or whatever, back then, we argued about numbers online. Maybe I just put it in the geeky parts of the internet, I don't know. Anyway, let's look at why this works, okay? First off, we've got this right here. That was the proof that I always had to use when people would argue about this. I'd say, well, any number, any single digit repeating, you can put over 9. Therefore, 9 repeating is going to be 9 over 9, which is equal to 1. Bam. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone liked that. So here's another thing that some people would use. This is actually kind of, well, tell us. Let's say we had 1 minus 0 0.9. What does that equal? 0.1. What if we had 1 minus 0 0.99? So we have two 9s now. 0 0.01. What if we had 1 minus 0 0.999? 0 0.001. What pattern do you notice? Hopefully you just said, well, Mr. Olson, the pattern that I noticed is that each time I add a 9, it adds a 0. And I like that you talk in complete sentences like that. It's very good. Um, so if we had four nines, it would be yeah, another zero. So what if we have an infinite number of nines, 0.9 repeating, going on forever and ever and ever? Then it would have 0, 0.0 repeating, followed by one. Zeros forever and ever and ever. If we have an infinite number of zeros, if we ever get to that one, does that one really matter? Does it even exist? It doesn't. It just doesn't matter at all. Which means that really, the difference between one and 0.9 repeating is nothing. Or a whole lot of zeros if you prefer. Well, uh, it's been real. Hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Um, bye.